Welcome, everybody. It is my distinct pleasure to be back with Mario Garza of Symbolic Studies for another Vibrant. He has done seasonal research for the last couple of years, and every time he comes around back to the sign uh, of the of the times, he finds new things that fascinate him, builds on old ideas, and he had presented an idea to me about what we could do a Vibrant on because I just missed doing them with him. So he threw that at me, and I found some interesting stuff to add to the mix, and we're going to be talking about kingdoms, kings, and crosses, and some other tangents that I couldn't help but pull out of the gravy portal but first welcome everybody in the live chat it's awesome those of you that come and be here at 7 p.m central and you know make the effort to show up and hang out with each other and everyone's so cool and there's never any problems in the chat at all i appreciate that and liam anderson with a 10 euro super chat before we even ladled anything thanks buddy i see michelle in here michelle's crushing lately gotta give a shout out to mario's fiance Michelle she's really found uh, a, a couple of nice niches as a podcaster especially loving all the pet health content she's been doing so anyone else in the chat Shelly Cherie <laughs> Elliot there's a lot of you I can't name you all but it's good to see you really happy about this Mario how have you been buddy I'm solid dude thanks for having me Interverse is like a uh, home away from home so one of the first channels that had me on and um you know, always appreciative for that. It's always great when we can come together and weave things out. And this one's a good one, man. There's so many things to talk about. I'm very curious to hear what you have to say about it because you're telling me in private that, you know, uh, there are just things that you were coming across, you know, to add to the mix with everything, as you're saying. And it's a potent weave, that's for sure. Yeah, I had to leave stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me too. I I'm leaving stuff out. Definitely. But dude, you, your growth has been phenomenal to watch. We're actually about neck and neck on YouTube subscribers right now, which I think is so cool because as both our channels grow, we just continue that synergistic snowball effect and you deserve yeah. it, man. You deserve lots of eyes on your work because you're very studious. I actually <laughs> used a pretty fun vocab word, sedulous, sedulous actually is how you say it, which is somebody that's just persistent and putting out effort. That was a... Mm. My, my 50 cent word in the show <laughs> description, <laughs> because you, nice. you are like that, you know, you just keep plugging away, keep your research going. And yeah, what, so what do you love most about this time of year in Aries season? I thought I'd ask you that first. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, just the fact that it's the beginning of the astrological year. So you're talking about, you know, the beginning of cycles, the ending of cycles, um, Aries season to me, it's always a reminder to just stand in my own authority, my own power, my own strength. Uh, there's a lot of symbolism related to what we're talking about today that's going to get into that. Obviously, the return of the sun, you know, um, that really begins with the winter solstice, but it's obviously it's, it's more apparent right now, and I'm grateful for that, absolutely. And um, yeah, I love the spring signs. You know, they're so beautiful and they're so deep. Taurus, too, the transition into Taurus from Aries to Taurus. Uh, Taurus season and, and bull symbolism, cow symbolism, that was one of my first loves with uh, my research, you know, with symbolic studies and everything, because that's a huge deep weave too. And so, yeah, there's so many awesome things happening here. It's your birthday. I know that too, or it was your birthday. Happy belated. So Today uh, I, is Yorgo's birthday from Third Eye Edify. Oh, there George you go. George Mesa. Yeah, happy Beautiful. birthday, Yorgo. Love you, happy buddy. Happy birthday, man. Very cool. But uh, yeah, you know, every season has just different things going on that I appreciate about it. And it's been really cool, actually. The reason why I wanted to get into this topic is because of what I've been reading lately. So if you don't mind, I love to share just a couple of book recommendations. And I think actually last time I was on a Vibrant, I was just starting to scratch the surface with this author and that author is Rene Ganon. And so I've been singing his praises lately. And for my money, I think he's one of the best symbologists of the modern world. The first book that I got of his that I definitely recommend to people, it's called Fundamental Symbols. Nowadays it goes by Symbols of the Sacred Science. And so this is more of a compendium of uh, different symbology uh, breakdowns with different symbols. This one's Look at fantastic. all those bookmarks. I know. Yeah, dude, I got a ton of them for, <laughs> for sure. Uh, so I started off there 
absolutely fantastic. He actually completely blew me away. And then I read The Great Triad, which we will be getting into today. And this is really about the relationship between heaven, man, and earth. And man being the axis or the bridge or the mediator between heaven and earth. He gets into a lot of Eastern philosophy. He really was a um, he was an important person in that he brought a lot of philosophical, metaphysical, spiritual ideas, symbolic ideas from the East and brought it over to the West. And so that's one of his big sort of claims to fame. And then, very appropriate for today as well, I read The King of the World by Rene Ganon, and this really gets into the template of king symbolism, which is what we're getting into, right? And it is absolutely fascinating. He really schooled me on so many things I wasn't aware of. And he, to be honest with you, dude, he's given me a foundation I didn't know I needed. You know, and I had been doing symbolic research for a number of years at this point, but okay. what I kind of figured out is that a lot of my favorite researchers and authors and books, they were referencing his work. And so I'm kind of looking at this guy as he, he's like my teacher right now, you know, and then right now I just finished this a few days ago, but Symbolism of the Cross by Rene Ganon. And so uh, obviously we're going to talk about crosses and things like that. This one is a little more dense, I would say. So I would probably recommend the other three before getting into this one. But he has a huge body of work. Um, he really understood, too, the tendency of modern man with symbolism and, and why modern people think certain, uh, you know, have a certain kind of approach when it comes to symbology. And so he's really interested in what he refers to as the primordial tradition, really going back to the old world and, and what ancient peoples, how they viewed the heavens, how they viewed uh, symbolism and everything else. And so he had a lot of things to say um, about modernity. He was critical about the modern world. That's another thing that I, I personally appreciate about him. Um, so he was very much steeped in uh, various traditions and, and things of that sort, but I'm just really uh, appreciative of him right now, and I'll say that he has sort of a base. There's a stability to his work that I'm really, really digging, and uh, you know how I am with the world axis. He incorporates the world axis with essentially most everything he, he does. All of his books make reference to it, and the symbolic value of the world axis and how it relates to the center and what the center actually represents and all of that. So. I just wanted to throw that out there. If people are interested in this topic, you're going to get a lot of juice uh, from those books there. Man, I've never heard of this guy, but looking through his bibliography, it's totally right up my alley. Yeah. I appreciate yeah, yeah. the tip. Uh, that one about the triad. <laughs> what is it called again? The Great Triad. The Great Triad. So I just got a book today. It's actually a novel by Dr. Christopher McIntosh called oh. Return of the Tetrad which I'm going to be mm. reading and uh, we're going to have kind of a different conversation coming up in May. He's coming back on the show and we'll talk about his fiction a bit. And I think I'm going to try to bring into that conversation, some of his hyperborean material as well, but I know that you're sure. familiar with his work and yeah, there's just a, we, we live in an age where there's just a, so much wealth of, of knowledge available. Like I'm, I'm surprised more people aren't like you and me and just sort of obsessively <laughs> collecting everything they can about these uh, amazing mind, body, spirit, expanding topics. Super cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I'm definitely yeah, going to yeah. be on the lookout to pick up some of his work, especially curious about the dense cross one. You know, like ah. we're going to barely do the subject justice in one live stream talking about the cross, but maybe we should, you know, want to go ahead and get into it. Let's do it, man. Yeah. The reason why that book is dense, um, by the way, is because he's really dealing with spatial symbolism. And that's some of what we're going to be talking about today. And so he really gets into the mathematics of space, essentially. And so the whole sort of thing that I wanted to discuss today was this idea of kings and their kingdoms being related to the cross, right? And the way I break it down and what I've understood while doing my research and, and reading his material and everything else was that 
the king used to believe that that they were essentially what united heaven and earth together and so this relates to this great triad concept that they are the bridge or the axis between the above and the below and so when we're talking about axis symbolism or axial symbolism it really symbolically represents the center. It represents the point um, in the middle and everything has a center. You can't escape that. This whole entire topic actually relates very nicely with wheel symbolism. And so the emperor- Yes, it does. Right. The emperor wanted to reign from the center of the wheel, essentially, is kind of what it breaks down to. And so his kingdom, oftentimes in the ancient world, was divided into four- quadrants four main sections north south east and west and my understanding is that this paralleled or mirrored what was happening in the heavens as so many things um have worked out that way people seeing things in the heavens and so they duplicate it here on earth on earth if it's good enough for the gods it's good enough for us and so the heavens was divided into a cross and so arguably there's several ways of looking at that right even if you look at the zodiac you know, you have the fixed signs or the cardinal signs, uh, the mutable signs. You have uh, the solstices and the equinoxes creating a cross, right? And so they mirrored that same dynamic on Earth. And the emperor's throne, symbolically, he existed right in the middle of that cross, the crossroads. And in another book that I read several years ago at the center of the world by John Michel, he got into this too about this idea that traditionally, according to his research, there were a lot of kingdoms that were divided by this great cross, and they had four quadrants. So everything was quartered, north, south, east, and west. And it wasn't uncommon for there to be a north and south road and an east and west road that broke up the whole entire kingdom. And so from that central point, the four directions emanate, right? So north, south, east, and west. Um, but there's actually two more directions, which would be up and down. And so when you're talking about space and spatial symbolism, it's really not unlike a cube, right? There's six different sides to the cube. There's six different sides uh, to space, up, down, left, right, forward, and backward. And so from that central point, the king was considered to be, if he aspired to his... Um, you know, spiritual sort of potential that they would be considered the unmoved mover in that they move the wheel, but they themselves are still. And so what I'm realizing as this relates to wheel symbolism is that everything on the circumference of the wheel, the outside of the wheel, this is more so related to cycles. This is more so related to patterns. Um, I kind of think of literally uh, when people say that they're on the hamster wheel with work or, or whatever it is they're doing in life, I think about the hamster wheel. I think about all of these things that are kind of outside of self. When you're in the middle of the wheel, you're at the what's referred to as the invariable middle or the immutable point within the wheel. And so people like to say that you break out by going in and that it's true. And so when you look at the wheel, what I've realized is that you're never going to really break out of the circumference of the wheel. It doesn't work that way. What you can do, though, is go to the center point of the wheel and you become the unmoved mover. You become that which is still but spins the wheel. And there's actually um, a lot of different metaphors to this, like Buddha was called uh, the person who turns the wheel of the law, you know, but he himself is actually idle. Right. And so this center point of the, the wheel the dharma chakra it's all yes. over buddhist symbolism and even chakra right that just means wheel right if i'm not mistaken yeah and so wheel symbolism is so interesting that middle point is symbolically represented in my opinion with the pole star in the heavens ganon writes about that as well that this was the ancient sort of understanding because it is the axle of the wheel of heaven this obviously has a relationship with the North Pole. We're talking about axial symbolism, right? And so my estimation, uh, based on what I've come across, you know, there really truly is a thread between the center of the cosmos, the center of Earth, and the center of self. It's actually the same point, you know. Uh, our humanness has a hard time understanding that, 
but on a, a pure metaphysical level, it's actually the same point. In fact, there's only one point. And so this center point, Ganon refers to as the principle and as the supreme center. And so when kings were uh, ruling over their kingdom, they believed that they occupied that center point. And that center point is along the line of the axis, which bridges the gap between heaven and earth. And this relates a lot too to like the Hierophant card as well. Um, the idea of a Pope being the uh, bridge builder, you know, between the gods and, and, and man and, and things like that. So once it's pointed out, once you start studying it, you realize that it's actually all over the place. Yeah, man, that's a great introduction to the subject matter. And as we progress forward, you had some images that you had shared with me before we came on the stream. If you want me to pull any of those up, just let me know. And sure. I've got them ready. But one of my favorite things I ever heard about the king as the, you know, as the bridge between heaven and earth, especially in Eastern cultures, I have not been able to find the receipt on it. I know where I heard it. It was on an episode of Mysterious Universe, and they were talking about uh, Chinese dynasties of the ancient world and their practices. Mm -hmm. And these practices may, you know, it's to me it sounded reasonable, and they may have been, you know, it may have been correct. But I haven't been able to find. So if anyone finds this, what I'm about to talk about out there, please send it to me because I'd really like to know where uh, historical anthropologists came up with this idea or where it's recorded or whatnot. But there's this idea of the king or the emperor as the measuring stick of the kingdom and that things like the uh the tonal center of music for the ki for the empire or for the the kingdom was determined by a flute or a pipe made from the length of the royal cubit i believe which is like the the elbow to the wrist or elbow to the fingertips i'm not sure but basically they would use that the king as the yardstick for everything musically measurement wise and probably some other things as well and it seems like that would be a real pain to have to go and redo that and you know later on if that guy dies and they get a new king but the idea is that that's how you the king would keep the mandate of heaven or express the mandate of heaven or that the king being the divine you know it, uh, deified being that they are that of course that means that they're the representative of the heavenly father who in all the esoteric traditions is also known as not just the unmoved mover or unmoving mover but like one of the meanings behind that phrase is that it's the pattern behind everything it's what it's how everything is put together and what puts everything together in the harmonic structures that they are put together in and so to me that sounds like a really cool idea i don't know if that's true but it's plausible based on what i know of how these systems worked in the ancient world and i really like that you brought up the cube as well that's six directions if you unfold the cube it actually makes a cross people have probably seen that in uh oh dang who's the artist that's sur the surrealist guy <laughs> i'm just blanking on it oh, are you, you know dolly? yeah yeah dolly yeah right but then there's also interestingly if we're keeping it in the realm of six or maybe six directions with a center point that gives us also seven notes or seven colors and in that sense it sort of keeps you contained within a kingdom or a world or a dimension or an octave but if you take it to the next level of the six directions and then do inward and outward as a sort of dimensionality now you've reached the eight you know you've mm -hmm. gone up an octave so in that way the the inner world is a kingdom for each person and the outer world is like an octave uh, a bigger octave in a sense of their inner world and then there's also in this idea of uh boundaries and rather than just the cross representing the the point of the center of a kingdom or crossroads there's also the practice of putting hermstones at the boundaries to places or at actual crossroads and i always thought that the uh the, the roman historians got some bad information or have made some incorrect assumptions when they talk about this god that they call terminus that is the god of boundaries because to me all i see in terminus and the statues that they call terminus is hermes <laughs> in the hermstone not to mention the etruscan version of hermes is called termes so it's terminus 
And I think that that's something that goes on a lot is the, uh, the huge variety and multiplicity of gods and goddesses seems to be mostly expanded out of misconceptions about adding new gods based on epithets or titles or other languages or letter swaps, other ways of spelling the same thing. So not only does the cross have the, the center axis point, but also it can mark the boundaries of the kingdom itself in, in some cases. So it's sort of an all inclusive idea. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly, man. Awesome stuff, dude. Um, yeah. Re regarding that center point, as it relates to, uh, you know, the boundary stones, I've heard them referred to as um, stone of portions, the dividing stone as well. Right. And it's really no different than what we're looking at with the background here with a, a central polar mountain. Right. And so that central mountain, this ancient idea of there being a mountain in the middle of Earth, um, there's so many variations on that theme that exist out there. And a mountain bridges the gap between heaven and earth. And the mountain as well, or that stone right there in the middle of that cross, would be the fifth point. And so this also relates the emperor or the king or the lord. To me, these are very much interchangeable sort of uh, titles, emperor, king, and lord. And so even uh, the king of the world, the original translation was the lord of the world. And when you are in the middle of this crossroads where that stone would be, where this mountain would be, you are operating as the fifth point, right? Or kind of this fifth way. And so in that way too, you're identifying yourself with the quintessence. So you're identifying yourself with spirit, essentially. And so those four quadrants of your kingdom, from uh, which emanate from that cross, uh, those can be symbolically represented as the four you know, elements or the four directions. But when you're right there in the middle, then you are the fifth element. And you're right uh, regarding the seventh point, too, in the middle of that cube. That makes a lot of sense. And then it also makes a lot of sense that uh, the eight would be represented, uh, representative there as well. And so that seems to be the thing. It's so interesting. It's like once you start looking into like deep numerology, the numbers just kind of emanate forward. They kind of all unfurl and they're all kind of hidden, you know, within that same sort of space or dynamic. So maybe if you want to pull up one of the Emperor cards, the Rider Waite version. So uh, that's 001 in the files that I sent you. You'll see that it's very curious what they decided to do here in that they depicted the Emperor as a central mountain. And this is something that I think can very easily be overlooked. And this actually isn't tradition either. You don't see this depicted in too many cards, but this is one of the most classic decks out there. And so you have two mountains on the side, and then you have the emperor right there in the middle. And so to me, they are essentially relating him to a central mountain. And this gets into a lot of the symbolism that Ganon got into in uh, The King of the World, where essentially what he says is that the original blueprint for the king or emperor or lord is a polar king. It's a northern king uh, ruling Agartha or ruling some sort of hidden uh, kingdom, essentially. And he makes the case that a lot of these hidden kingdoms essentially have a northern polar central correspondence, that that is the idea behind these kingdoms. And that's the idea behind, say, uh, you know, concepts related to like a celestial Jerusalem or what some people have referred to as hyperspace kingdoms is that they relate more to the supreme center. They relate more to a, a primordial sort of tradition, which everything in the primordial tradition, according to Ganon, has everything to do with the center, that it's all about the center. It's about the center of the wheel, the center of self, earth and the heavens and this axis that bridges the gap between them. So to me, that's fascinating. And this is reminding me that the Emperor card is the fourth card of the Major Arcana. It's not uncommon for him to be holding a Globus Cruciger that has a cross on it. And if you want to go to the Maru uh, map, which I'm sure most of your audience has seen at this point, but this central mountain, a lot of times they correspond with this idea of four, uh, four rivers emanating from the mountain, four winds emanating from that place as well. And so it lines up with all the stuff that I've been learning about. 
Also, I'll say that this idea of Earth having four corners, I used to think that it was the four extreme corners, that it was the four edges of the square. But what I'm realizing now with this new symbolism, that it actually might be a reference to the inner corners at the crossroads in the center of that great cross. Kind of like if you visit the four corners region here in the US, you stand in the middle of the four corners and you're in four states at once. You're kind of symbolically embodying you know, what we're trying to get across here with that emperor or Lord, you know, resting right there in the middle of that cross. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> the four corners being in the middle at the crossing point rather than out in space somewhere. And you know, one thing that uh, I really like about symbolism is how it can contain dual meanings. And then there's layers beyond what initially seemed there, or even several examinations would reveal. And so I constantly see this interesting parallel between solar and polar symbolism. For me, they're not necessarily at odds, although some people will make it out that way that, you know, it's either one or the other. I can see a, a definite crossovers for good reasons. And one of the reasons that I uh, am thinking of now that is just a spontaneous thought is I've as someone that doesn't believe I'm on a spinning ball flying through an infinite vacuum, right? <laughs> I personally pl play around with all kinds of potential cosmologies, but one that sticks with me and is my favorite is that the earth itself grows and that in the process of the earth growing, new luminaries, what we call planets, might also come out of that process. And that, uh, for example, Mercury could be a sun at the center of the wheel in it, you know, the middle wheel. Mm. And then our, our world, what we call earth is the next wheel circumferencing that. And then there's one beyond that where potentially Mars and Venus are a sun and moon in that sphere. And it makes sense in some ways, like Venus does this, uh, phasing thing, just like our moon, for example. And then, you know, another ring out could be Jupiter and Saturn in a similar way. All that's just conjecture, but if that ended up being true and that at a, the period of like what they call the destruction and regeneration of the world or the flood or the mud flood, when the earth grows, goes through an electrolysis process of sort of recharging all of the energy in the realm and then expanding <laughs> because electrolysis, it's like God plugging in the battery. <laughs> electrolysis can create like sludge or mud and, and new water and all of that. Like it's been demonstrated. So maybe that's something that happens on a big scale. I don't know. But if that's the case, wouldn't it be interesting that the new sun would be, that's an androgyne, <laughs> would be born at the center of the world where the pole is? That's what I find really interesting. Well, there's definitely something to that. I mean, it lines up symbolically with a lot of things I have come to understand. For sure. So I I appreciate the growing earth sort of idea, obviously, just like the growth rings of a tree, you know, um, and certainly polar and solar symbolism, at least the way Ganon puts it, is that polar symbolism is just more primordial. And so they uh, they have so much overlapping uh, symbolism that you you it's hard to separate the two, but that the polar came before the solar. And so in a way, I almost kind of look at the pole itself and that central point. You can't reduce that any further. You can't reduce the central point any further. You can't reduce the, the supreme center. Um, you know, once it's undifferentiated, that's another thing he talks about quite a bit, is that that central point is the undifferentiated sort of point. And so it's pure uh metaphysical you know pure metaphysics at this point that you know everything we see kind of around us um you're dealing with the multiplicity you're, you're dealing with things that uh he i think he likes to say that you're dealing with reflections of that original point of that original polar sort of axis everything else emanates from that and when you are on that wheel the cycle of life you know uh, you're dealing with things that are um essentially outside and the supreme center from which everything emanated from it comes from this one undifferentiated sort of single point which contains everything basically 
And so uh, it gets very heady and very metaphysical. And so I, I'm sticking with a lot of symbolic sort of threads here. I know that it's, it's impossible to kind of um, completely separate these ideas or whatever, but uh, that's, that's how he tends to put it. And so one of the things I've been thinking about too is as it relates to polar and solar, I don't know if we've talked about sort of the circumambulation rituals, right? Uh, I know we've discussed things like that before, but he makes it pretty clear that when you're dealing with a clockwise rotation, you're dealing with a solar sort of nature. It's more of an expansive, essentially. I think it's very interesting that all of our clocks go clockwise and they have a 12 numbers on it, a very solarized number. But when you go counterclockwise, just like the stars around the pole star, you, that's more of a polar rotation in that it actually goes back to the center. So polar symbolism tends to go back to that pole, and then solar symbolism tends to be expansive and kind of uh, grow, essentially. But they're so related that you know you, you need to know both. And just in the yin and yang of it all, a, a reason why there's both or why it helps to have both lenses is just the same as the, the masculine and feminine energies, the outward projecting, you know, the clockwise spiral that's going out further and further. And then the inward spiraling corkscrew feminine energy, like those, those are both simultaneous forces in our world and in our bodies in, in everything. everything so yeah. I, I really like that. I like being able to have both lenses simultaneously. And I like to make that distinction so that people listening aren't confused when we speak about one and then the other, that it's kind of like the God and the goddess in a way. And they're both emanations from that same point. And also, you know, just like the androgyne versions of these savior deities that uh, could be construed at the center of the, the North or construed as riding, you know, the chariot of the sun in different contexts. And a lot of polar symbolism has been transferred over to the sun. So if you're going to look into solar anything, you know, how many people, I know you have a different perspective, but how many people consider the sun to be the center of their whole entire system? You know, that literally it operates <laughs> as, a, as a pole. Even you look at the sun card, you know, especially the newer versions of the sun, uh, not the classic versions of the sun where you usually have two children in front of a brick wall. But like on the Rider weight version, he has that huge pole with him that has a flag on it, you know, so relating the sun to the pole, you know, it's a it is a pole, you know, it's a pole in so many different respects, for sure. So I, I hear you loud and clear. And definitely, it is like what you're saying, it, it's worth knowing both that that's my conclusion too. is that it's, uh, it's holistic that way to understand both. But it's also holistic too to understand that you know, it seems as though there have been traditions that preceded the solar tradition, that preceded the solar age and, and perhaps solar worship and things like that. Jenny says, circle of fifths, clockwise, odd, Adam, circle of fourths, reverse, counterclockwise, even or Eve. That's mm. great. That, that sounds a lot like what I heard. Uh, I was listening to Bio Charisma, Topher's podcast, and he's talking to Stephanie Peterson, I think that's her last name, and they're getting into this <laughs> music gravy and the 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 pattern, basically. But we're digressing. Uh, I'm going to let you <laughs> take us into some of the more some more ideas that you've got on the docket. Yeah, sure. So maybe the next thing that you can share would be the coordinates image I sent over, and you know these are just. Cartesian coordinates. So what we're talking about, spatial symbolism, the six directions. And so in many ways, this central point that the emperor or king of old believed that he related to is really no different than the Z axis, right? And so you have the X axis, the Y axis, and then you have that vertical Z axis. And that vertical Z axis is what bridges the gap between different realities, you know, uh, between different orders of life, essentially. And so Ganon goes into great, great detail about the difference between what's happening on the horizontal plane and then what's happening on the vertical plane. Way too much to get into. 
I probably need to reread his book to completely fully understand what's going on there. Um, it's like the density axis, you could think. Right. I was bringing yeah. this up in a, pre a recent show, but you know about the ocean under the ocean? Oh, uh, I don't I don't know. Maybe uh, I know. Oh, about man, you got to look into this. OK, so Wait. this is one in my opinion, this is one of the greatest evidences for the cosmology of a firmament and and all that. But it's in the reverse. So you're talking about mm -hmm. this vertical axis. I think that that's the axis of density. And you know that based on how things <laughs> float or sink. Right. But below the ocean, like at the ocean floor, there have been found shores where there's like a type of water that mm. is denser than the ocean water and there are beaches and shores and this other type of water that is looks exactly like a beach on our surface level but not exactly like because it's below the sea but anyway the like submarines and and craft that have tried to go into that water or whatever we want to call it they bounce off of it can't Ooh. can't penetrate it <laughs> and in a similar way people have tried to escape the atmosphere of our density level they seem to things seem to bounce off of something right we've seen that a lot too so there could be like these density boundaries similar to uh you know basically like a fish doesn't easily go out of the surface of the water and there's like a surface tension huge mm -hmm. density difference. I think this is happening potentially on a scale of of dimensions up upwards and downwards that may go infinitely for all we know. It's really interesting. So I just wow. wanted to add that about the Z axis. Look into the 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 ocean shore like the ocean below the ocean or the shores below the shore. I'll see if I can pull something up like a picture of it. Excellent. Excellent. I would love to see that actually for sure. That is fascinating. I mean, the waters above and the waters below, right? That makes a lot of sense to me. Density absolutely plays a part in what's going on here. And I'll say, to be honest with you, one of the things I've been thinking about as it relates to cosmology and, and what we live on, the thing that's been turned upside down, literally, is this idea that humanity doesn't share a consensus up or a consensus down. And I'm starting to understand that we actually all share the same up and the same down. That people in Australia don't have a different up than us. They don't have a different down than us because we actually are on the same plane. It seems to me like that's what's going on here. So the fact that there is this old tradition of what is up symbolically has a correspondence with the heavens. The heavens have a correspondence with all sorts of different things. Earth has a correspondence with all sorts of different things. And that these two ideas of the above and the below, heaven and earth, that they were fixed in so many ways. And that there were traditions and stories and, and myths and common sense sort of things that made a lot of sense with what was associated with the above and the below. And so now we live in a world, though, where that's not even, you know, true to a lot of people. That there isn't a consensus reality with what's considered up and what's considered down. And so to me, I think that's a very interesting sort of thing. I think that this is one of the sort of tricks um, that's been kind of thrusted upon us is that we don't share an up and we don't share a down. In my opinion, I think we do. And so when you look at this graph, right, this makes a lot of sense, the z-axis emanating from the two other uh, axis points that cross over with each other. In my opinion, just, just talking about it from a, a polar perspective, it makes more sense to discuss something like this from a polar dynamic, you know, polar coordinates versus say like a solar dynamic. So that's kind of the difference of what preceded what, you know, you wouldn't explain this in terms of solar symbolism, but it would make sense to explain it in terms of polar symbolism, right? And so this is just another sort of way of looking at this material, in my opinion. And uh, since you're sharing stuff, maybe share the uh, scan 002 or, uh, Either one, actually. Maybe go with 001 since it's the first one. Okay, I'm going to pull that up. But before I do, I'm just going to show a couple quick images of what I was talking about. Yeah. And so people know what to look up. I think the best bet is to look up underwater lakes. And they say that like the official story is that it's like salty, briny, 
and that's why it's a different density level. But <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they're right about that. It seems mm. like it'd be pretty hard to explore. Uh, so it's just some random that's really images cool. that come up when you look for that. But see, this is this looks like it's above water, but this is an underwater photo. Wow! And there's a sea under the sea. And they found these in more than one place. And as far as I know, you can't really, some of them you can't even get into. It's uh, it's weird stuff. Right, right. That's fascinating. Yeah, it makes you think. <laughs> it makes you think about the whole levels of density question that the new age people talk about. Definitely, definitely. So as I mentioned, Ganon, he really bridged uh, a lot of information from the east to the west. And he spends a lot of time talking about several different emperors, uh, ancient Chinese emperors, and their sort of framework and how they perceived their kingdom. And if you zoom in on that square there, if it's possible, there's nine squares, right? Kind of looks like a magic square. There's nine squares within that larger square. And essentially, this was apparently an old way of dividing up your kingdom and that the emperor would occupy the central square, which associates with the number five, which would be that fifth point in the middle of that cross. And so um, so I think that's fascinating. Even he mentions the fact that there are different kingdoms that were referred to as the five kingdoms in China. But this five kingdoms business is essentially a, it's a reference to that central point that relates to the number five, which that's fascinating too, because as I mentioned earlier, the Hierophant card is the fifth card in the major arcana. And the symbolism with the Hierophant is that he's well known for being the Pope. And the full title of the Pope is Pontifex Maximus, which is the ultimate bridge builder. So it's relating to this bridge idea. And this is something to me that I think is interesting too, the idea that these kings of old, that they were kind of operating in several different realms, that, that they viewed themselves on like multiple tiers. And so this relates to this great triad sort of idea that they were actually a king of three different worlds, not just one world. And so in one way, they are the king, but then in another way, they operate as priest. And then in another way, they also operate as a prophet. And so he really breaks down this idea, too, of uh, ancient kings having this three-tiered sort of nature to them. And if I'm not mistaken, too, that I believe is a common thing with the Hierophant card is, is that Pope hat, if I'm not mistaken, has like three tiers to it. And the number three, even like in the Crowley Th Thoth version of the card, he has like a scepter and there's three circles on it. So the three the also relate tiara. to the Hierophant. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they have the they carry the staff with the cross with the three lines. And yes. one of the one of the ways that this can be solar, for example, is the because the sun kind of does that exact idea of circumferencing the world, or at least it appears to, right? It travels everywhere. And the tropics could potentially be those three lines. I'm not saying I know that what it is, but that's the zone in which, you know, it travels yeah. or the ecliptic, you know, it doesn't rise or fall below a certain line and that's the ecliptic of the zodiac right that's right, right. one interpretation yeah yeah no exactly for sure and so if you cruise on over to the uh other scan scan 002 i thought this was interesting as well and this is going to be a uh a chinese character and what is said about this character is that it's an expression of these three worlds being bridged with that vertical axis. Sorry, I didn't manage to download that one, but I got it now. Here we go. Oh, no, you're all good. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to point this out that the... Is that right? Is this... This is zero zero two? Did this I get is... that wrong? No, you're good. You're good. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, uh, I, I've noticed today that the word, the Chinese word Huang and... The character that represents king was a cross. I was going to bring that up. Nice one. Excellent. There you go. Yeah, exactly. So essentially that vertical axis is that central axis we're referring to. So this idea of the king being at the center is really, really embedded in tradition. 
And it was just unbeknownst to me. I had some inclinations and, and some hunches about some of this stuff, you know, um, a while back, but it, it's really, really kind of come to light in, in this sort of recent um, rabbit hole that I've been down. But once again, vertical axis, world axis, heaven, man, and earth uh, being sort of connected with that vertical axis. <laughs> nice one. But yeah, exactly. I, I couldn't help but think of Wang that way too, obviously. <laughs> Makes me, my, I love my mom. Sometimes she says funny stuff. Like I, this was a long time ago, but we we're, we we're eating something and she didn't really like it. And she's like, it's got a funny Wang to it. <laughs> I'm like, Oh really? <laughs> I don't know what Wang tastes like. <laughs> I think you mean twang. And she's like, no, people say Wang. And I'm like, no mom. They don't. <laughs> Not in that way. <laughs> That's funny, man. That reminds me, my dad one time, I was at home and we were just watching TV and out of nowhere, he said, man, he's like, this penis is so good. And I was like, excuse me? And he said it again. He goes, this penis is so good. And me and my sister just looked at each other and I was like, dad, say that one more time. And he goes, these peanuts, they're so good. I was like, oh, thank God. Okay. Top of the list of things you don't <laughs> want to hear your dad say. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It was so funny. Uh, anyways, there you go. Yeah, Boober parents, we love you. For sure, for sure. But yeah, dude, I would love to hear your thoughts about some of this stuff. I know you put some slides together. Very curious to see what you came across and what you're thinking. Awesome, man. Well, I'll, I'd love to. I'm going to I'll start sharing my screen. And I opened this gravy portal and it, uh, it just kind of kept on going. So as yeah. I bring things up, if I'm kind of just pushing through it a little fast, feel free to jump in on any of it. And sure, I'll try sure. to make time for you to say stuff as well. Uh, we'll, we'll start to get a little out of, uh, like a little out in the weeds on some of this stuff, but I, I think you'll see how it all relates by the end. Now, the first thing that came to mind when you were saying Kings and crosses, I couldn't help but think of Harry Potter and how when Harry and the other wizards and witches go to Hogwarts where they cross into the other world, they go in a, they go at a place called King's Cross Station. And later in the series, like the last book, when Harry has his death and resurrection, he basically goes into the spirit world or his inner world. And it appears to him when he meets the Dumbledore as his guide, who's deceased, it appears to him that he's in the King's Cross station. So the symbolism of that is uh is massive because he's kind of like he's he's the master of of the Deathly Hollows, and there's like the triangle symbolism with that, and the three the three pieces, the three points, the three worlds, the master mm -hmm. of life, death, and spirit, you could say, or who who knows? But that just came to mind, and I, I think that this concept of the the king as the bridge between worlds it is so embedded in our psyche and it's mm -hmm. not always just the king per se but it's the hero the hero mm -hmm. as a it, you know the king emperor being associated with aries well so is just the hero or the protagonist and or the savior as harry more represents that or the innocent the innocent hero because he's kind of got that vibe as well innocence goes with aries as well so i'm thinking yeah, King's Cross. I, I just had to bring that up. That was the first thing that popped into my head. I wonder, you know, is there anything you could add on about that bridge between life and death as a, a kingly role or an Aries type role? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That That's a huge one, actually, because Aries corresponds with sacrifice. And Aries, in my opinion, symbolically Oh, yeah, and this represents... is where Harry sacrificed himself. Ah. in this point of the story there you go there you go i really need to watch it it's crazy that i haven't seen harry potter before you oh know, it's people... so rich with the the monomyth and the esoteric tradition you would get a lot more out of it than the average consumer it's actually yeah. pretty cool yeah that's what i've heard many people have told me that so i got to make time to do that aries represents he in one way he's the prince of the zodiac he, he's the leader of the zodiac he is the draft animal of the Zodiac, right? He like pulls the wheel that is the Zodiac. He, you know, he's head first, he's headstrong. And so on one level, he's the prince. What's the natural trajectory of a prince? It would be uh, being a king, right? So in the court card system, you have 
page, knight, queen, king, or you have princess, prince, queen, king. And so the prince becomes a king. So prince symbolism does relate to king symbolism. And there is so much to talk about with the sacrifice of the king, the, the killing of the king. And this idea that if a king isn't pulling his own weight, that he can be sacrificed, essentially. Uh, this relates to Christ being sacrificed, the king of kings, right? And so there's a huge, huge, huge overlay with sacrifice, even decapitation, I would say, as it relates to more head symbolism. Uh, the gesture. And thus the cross, sacrifice and the cross. We haven't even brought up that element of the cross I, yet. <laughs> I know, yeah, exactly. It's huge. And so, uh, so there's a lot going on there for sure. Also, too, I'm really diving into the Fool card right now because I'm going to do a whole Major Arcana series. And the Fool relates to the Jester, relates to the Clown, and relates to a lot of interesting things in, in that regard, but also to the Prince. One of the sort of nicknames that I came across for the Fool is the Wandering Prince. And so apparently there was a point in time where different kingdoms had a lineage that went through the daughter of the king and that it was actually uh through the female was their bloodline carried on and everything else and apparently the tradition was that only a foreigner or a traveler could come through and potentially dethrone the king that they actually wanted somebody outside of their kingdom outside of their village to take over the role of being a king and so uh, the fool actually relates to this idea as well of the prince, the wandering prince coming into town on the prowl, dethroning the king, killing the king, impregnating the princess and becoming the king himself. And so there's a whole thing about the prince killing the king, essentially, is what I've come across, which I think is kind of interesting. And then also the jester being the sort of surrogate kind of scapegoat for killing the king. So there's different rituals that happen during springtime where the king was killed, but in a, in a mocked sort of way, he wasn't actually literally killed, but they would take the jester or figure close to the jester or like a fool type figure. They would dress him up as the king and then they would ritually kill him, you know, in a, in a mockery sort of way. They didn't actually kill him. But uh, there's this idea that has existed for a really long time having to do with this king being killed for one reason or the other. And there's multiple variations on the theme there. But I think a lot of this stuff is kind of baked into Aries symbolism and what's going on here. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Majorly. Whether it's Igni or a uh, Agni of the Hindus, that's a ram that is sacrificed yeah. or right. Exactly. Jesus or Isis of the, the Druids and the Gauls or obviously Jesus, they call it Agnes Day. It goes on and on. Mm -hmm. uh, in Harry Potter, too, his name is Harry, which Hare means savior. And Potter is like the father, Potter, the shaper, the pattern, Pata, etc. So he's mm -hmm. the savior father or the the pattern of salvation, something like that, just in his name. And one thing I like about the series is in the extracurricular things that the author said about it is uh, she she makes sure all of the characters of the story have their birthdays known if you want to look into it. So you can like all of oh, the wow. heroes are typically like they're mostly uh, Leo's. <laughs> Harry's a Leo. That's the king. And all like all the bad guys are Capricorns. <laughs> <laughs> you know so the old right. king gotta go the saturn that's hilarious. but I'll, i'm gonna get into uh this next slide here i just wanted to go through some names for some words for king Ooh, in a few other languages because i think that that's got a lot of i mean it's just nice to compare and see mm -hmm. how there may be some diffusion here so one that i really like that i've got more to say about after we get to this slide is the ancient latin ancient greek word Basilius, which is a word for king. Now, in the modern Greek, they would actually pronounce that beta like a V, so it'd be Vasilius. Then in Latin, of course, we all know Lex. We know that, I'm sorry, Rex. <laughs> we know that the L and R interchange is really common. And so you have Rex Lex, that is the, the word and the king, or the, I'm sorry, the law and the king. Those ideas are cognate with each other through, through philology. 
Now, in a lot of the Romance languages, I'll just go through these real quick. So Spanish, it's Ray. Italian, it's Ray. <laughs> French, it's Roy. Mm. In Polish, it's Cruel. <laughs> cruel, something like that. Turkish, it's Kral. German, it's Kunig. Uh, Chinese, Guawang. In Japanese, it's just O. Oh. That's how you say it. And then Ooh. in Hebrew, it's Melek. So there's a lot. There's a lot there to think about. First of all, notice the similarity of the root sound craw, as in cross, for some of these. Yes. Like cruel, crawl, exactly. That's there. And then there's an interesting aspirate thing going on with the H sound, sometimes coming before the R. As the example would be the modern Romance languages are giving us this general word, ray or ra, as the word for king. And we know that X can interchange with C or H. So it makes a lot of sense that Rex would get kind of softened into just Ray, you know, or Roy as it is in French. But there's a difference that's interesting between the European Portuguese word for King and the Brazilian Portuguese, where the European says Ray, but the Brazilian say, Hey, as in that's the word for King. And there's a big aspirate push with the H sound. Now that H sound, in more guttural accents can easily get hard, which brings us back to the <laughs> craw cra sound of, of cross being potentially related to how some people say king. See what I mean? Like if the, if the word is Ray or Roy or Ra, then if someone's pushing that first syllable out with kind of a hard aspirate, because that's just the guttural way they talk, then all of a sudden Ra is like cra, just mm -hmm. like Ray becomes hey. For the brazilians so i think that's interesting and potentially related to how some people say king pa it's all anecdotal but i see connections here then there's the hebrew word cohen which means priest and relates to the word khan which is another way of saying king and it's also worth considering the word ras which means head or chief or first and wisdom uh, or resh in hebrew is an example or the ancient etruscans they called themselves the rasina or you have the rastafari uh, all of that of Ethiopia. And that word Ross is essentially the same as the word Rex because X and S are philologically interchangeable letters. And that Ross being the head meet literally Resh means head. That's also, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Resh is the letter that's on the sun card, for example, and Aries is the head in the Zodiac. And then you already showed this, but you got to notice this distinct cross that's in the glyph or letter in the Japanese and Chinese uh, like letter for king. Yes. It's like, it's definitely there. It's totally across. Yeah. I that, think that's, that's pretty what, cool. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that I, I love to see that. That was very, that's very interesting. Thank you for pulling this up, man. I love the fact that you're always um, looking into the etymology and the wordplay with everything. The thing that comes to my mind is uh beyond those two characters there the chinese and japanese characters with the three worlds being uh connected with that central axis the ray connection to me is interesting because there's ideas related to cosmic rays solar rays obviously and one of the things i've come across in one of these books by ganon <laughs> is that he gets into the seventh ray business. And I don't know if that's something you've ever tapped into or looked into. I think maybe we've lightly discussed it at some point before. I'm pretty sure the first time I was ever introduced to it was through my research related to Abraxas, right? And so Abraxas has seven le letters. Sometimes he's referred to as I believe either like the seventh power or the seventh ray. And these letters relate to this concept as well. And what Ganon mentions at one point is that the seventh ray is that central immutable point in the middle of us. Uh, you could even say the spatial cube, but that this ray is essentially a world axis symbol is what he says, is that it is what bridges the above and the below. And he says that this came out of this idea that there aren't actually seven colors of the rainbow. According to his work, there's actually six colors of the rainbow. And in one of his books here, he has the um, hexagram, uh, or he has the uh, Star of David, and he has the different colors on each point, six colors around the Star of David, 
the uh, obviously it's two triangles, one above and then one pointing down below. And he says in the middle of this uh, symbol would be the seventh ray, basically, not unlike, you know, the center of the cube. But this seventh ray is invisible. And this seventh ray is more of a cosmic sort of ray. It's more of a transcendental sort of ray and represents this golden thread or this uh, golden light that uh, spans, you know, the above and the below. So when I see that with ray, it kind of relates to a lot of this stuff here. It's interesting, man, because of somebody that's done a lot of coloring with markers, I always thought it is a bit of a stretch to call indigo like a separate color between <laughs> between blue and purple <laughs> or or maybe purple's the stretch i don't know but i could i could get behind that even on the body our seventh chakra the crown chakra is actually a little bit like above the head a little outside the body physically and thus it's kind of invisible because the other chakra centers they are located at a point in the body correlate to the physical body somewhere now you know chakras may be more conceptual although like i certainly can interact with them um, and, but maybe that's just because it's a language and my body can intelligence can speak to me through that language i don't know but that invisible seventh ray is an interesting idea and there is a useful <laughs> useful uh, correction by sirenita in your chat that spanish ray is actually spelled r-e-y not R A Y, but mm. same pronunciation. So like the, a good example though, of that aspirate thing, just to really nail it home is the French word Roy or Roy, Roy, however the Frenchies would say that you put a hard aspirate in front of that and you get quoi, C R O I X, which is cross. So mm. there's like, oh. I, I've never looked at words for King and cross before. And it was uh, amazing. I have as you offered this topic that as soon as I opened up the the philology goggles, it was like, yeah, <laughs> there's there's definitely linguistic connections that make these concepts cognate with each other. So I thought that was fun. And definitely. So remember, let's focus on this word though, basilius, because it's a, a little bit different from the rest of the list. It sticks out. And I wanted to point out the uh the basilica. Mm -hmm. Right? Basilicas are places from which a central authority gives orders and commands to a city or a region. And they tend to have this peak and this these crosses, or at least one cross that's at the top of the peak. Mm -hmm. So there's a connection to the, the king idea and the center idea, the basilica at the center of the town. Mm -hmm. And then look at the uh, plant basil. Do you see the, you see oh, the yeah. cross there in the leaf yeah. pattern? Yeah, that's really cool. It's totally there. And then again, the, the modern Greeks, they swap the letter, letter beta to sound like a V. So they would say Vasilius. And I think that's probably why Kings have vassals. So instead of basil, it's vassal, Vasilius. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. to me makes a lot of sense. Now this one, this one you're going to like, let's get a little conspiratorial for a second. The bank for international settlements is in Basel or Basel. Switzerland, there's your king idea and center idea. Mm -hmm. And it's this, this is the central bank for central banks. <laughs> it's oh, right. Double central bank. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's the oldest global financial institution. It's the mm -hmm. principal architect in the development of the global financial market, whatever the fuck that means. And mm -hmm. I want to point out, or I want you to tell me what do you see? And I'll even zoom in a little bit. What do you see when you look at this structure? Uh, it kind of looks phallic, uh, as do a lot of buildings. I don't know if that's what you're wanting me to point out. Um, and so I almost, it kind of looks like the base of a, of a phallus. But I mean, obviously you have the different tiers there. And so could relate to, uh, you know, some of the concepts that we're relating to over here. But yeah, I'm not sure, man. What, what do you see? What are you trying to point out? Well, there's something that is always a description of the Mount Maru or the city of Troy or mm -hmm. whatever the, the mythological center point or point of regeneration, holy mountain, what have you, is that they have these tiers or terraces and they're circular like rings 
and they uh, typically have like gardens or levels. And so yes. they don't, maybe they didn't have the room to do it all the way around, but they're mm. totally, at least in this portion, they're, they're giving us this, you know, Mount Maru symbolism vibe. And right. it's the center of <laughs> the center of all central banks. I mean, it doesn't get more ruler kingly <laughs> center point than that. It's a, uh, so, and it's in Basel, Switzerland. So remember Basilius, that's the word for King. Uh, I thought that was worth bringing up into the, the mix. Right. Right. I mean, even uh, the flag of Switzerland as well. Oh yeah. It's a cross, ain't it? Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> of course. And so like you mentioned me. crossing over at one point, uh, but that, that is one of the symbolic decodes related to the cross that I think is fascinating. The fact that you go to a cemetery and there's so many crosses and people just crossed over and that central point of the cross representing sort of this transition, right? Mm. I'm going to keep going here. So here's an, another thing, the basilisk. The basilisk is a very Abraxia, Abraxas-like creature that's a like middle, middle ages or alchemy writers would talk about the basilisk and it's i think it could like petrify you sort of medusa like with its gaze and one of the i can't i don't remember who the author was i forgot to put it in my notes but there was there was one author maybe pliny that said that the gold crested wren a type of bird mm. was was what people thought a basilisk was for some reason mm. and I thought that was interesting or like maybe that this type of bird was called a basilisk at some point. And I could see that in terms of the Basilius King vibe because it appears to have a crown. Yes. And I wanted to include that this because I've got a lot about birds that are per, that pertain to crosses coming up as we continue, but Ooh. You know, what do you what do you, you got anything about the basilisk? <laughs> you know, I'm sure you've come <laughs> across this in your studies. I mean, it does remind me of the Braxis thing for sure. Uh, those two serpents or eels, whatever they might be behind him, you know, a Braxis having the uh, serpentine legs essentially. And so um, the, yeah, the golden crown, that is really intriguing. I, I do like that. And this relates to the head symbolism, obviously Aries being the head of the Zodiac, the, the king being the head of his kingdom. Um, and then everything associates to uh, with this head idea, when you consider the mountain and you go up to the top of the mountain, I even thought about uh, being uh, the king of the mountain, right? And there's mountain symbolism with old ancient kings um, residing within a mountain as well, which is kind of intriguing. But um, yeah, but the basilisk specifically uh, hasn't been something that I've looked into too much, but I, I see the Abraxas symbolism, you know, on it all day. Uh, as well. And so even uh, literally a, a Braxis having a rooster head, a cock for a head, also relating to Mercury, you're going to find a lot of older depictions of Mercury, and there's going to be roosters around him and, and things like that. So kind of that phallic penetrative energy, you know, being on display, um, I think is interesting. And that certainly relates to Aries, that relates to a lot of things, actually, um, the Wang, as we were talking about earlier, you know, it, it just makes sense. And the last thing I'll add about the Wren, which is interesting, is that in Celtic mythology, the Wren was the symbol of the old year. And so there was a tradition of chasing around and killing a Wren and then parading it around the, the town while singing and dancing and collecting money for its burial. So that's Ooh. very much like a symbolic killing of the king if yes. this Wren is related or even was called a name similar to the word for King at one point, mm -hmm. poor guys. I feel like, dang, Celts you don't need to kill these little cuties. How rude, <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly airy symbolism, right? The, it is, oh, it is uh, sacrifice for the new year. The other thing I'll say that relates to all of this is wand symbolism. The wand being very phallic, the wand, spanning the gap between the above and the below i think when you hold a uh a staff you know you're 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 kind of holding your power you're owning your power and so i use the word pull these days when someone's giving away their power i i say that they are giving away their pull 
you know, and that they should really be holding on to it and they should be more centered. The poll also relates to this grounding and instability as well with it being embedded into the earth, not unlike a tree. And so wands relate to fire and it's not uncommon for wands in the tarot to be used like a torch. And so when you see a torch or a wand, very similar symbolism, but in order for fire to burn, there has to be fuel. And so wood would be that fuel. And so I think it's interesting that Aries is a fire sign, right? It's a cardinal fire sign. It has to do with sacrifice. And literally fire symbolically kind of relates to sacrificial symbolism just by the fact that it needs fuel and something needs to right. burn. It can't exist without it. Right. And that makes it a symbol for life as well, because life has to consume. Yes, exactly. Right. And of course, as we're talking about the uh, bird rooster dragon hybrids, Slick Dissident enters the chat. <laughs> Welcome, buddy. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to get into the real gravy. All right. So I have a few things from the ancient myth mythological and Roman historian Nimrod. And he says, the wheel upon which criminals were extended was a cross. Although the name of the thing was dissembled by Christians, it was a St. Andrew's cross of which two spokes confined the arms and to the legs. So we have this idea of criminals alongside the left and right of Jesus on his cross, but the St. Andrew's cross is maybe a more common or older version of this type of corporal punishment potentially mm -hmm. or at least in you know the the archive for what it's worth what is or isn't uh forgery who knows but you know it appears this way in a lot of art where their their hands and legs are outstretched in it and they're in an x shape rather than a t shape now of course an x and a t there's they're both crosses they're versions of a similar thing so i think it's clear that the symbolism overlaps but we're going to see a lot more about, you know, like I, this X rather than a T, I find really interesting. And there's, there's much that comes up with that. Like the, uh, how many things that we're going to talk about have this I X phonetic or root as a prefix or a suffix in the word. For example, this, this little plant here is called Ixora, I X O R A. And of course, it's got four petals and an X like a St. Andrew's cross. And in the Hindu tradition, this Ixora is the flower of choice to honor Lord Vishnu. And Vishnu mm. is the one that incarnates as characters like Krishna. It's the, the savior preserver part of the Hindu trinity is Vishnu. So that's why, like, remember, we just talked about B and V swapping. So now think about the bishops of the church, right? They're, they're <laughs> Vishnu, Bishop, Vishnu. It's a similar root there as well. And also this word Ixora is actually supposedly a Portu Portuguese word. And I think that it sounds a lot like Ishvara, Ixora, Ishvara, Isvara, Iswara. There's a lot of ways of saying it, but that's the Sanskrit word for Lord, which we've established Lord, King, Kind of similar concepts mm -hmm. so i like how yeah michelle it's it's a pretty one i like how uh the esoteric tradition can sometimes show up in uh, like actually all the time show up in botany and herbalism it's pretty cool oh yeah absolutely this is reminding me too because i wasn't thinking about plants or or you know any symbolism related to that but um just the uh rosy cross the rosicrucians right? What's their symbol? Their symbol is a cross. And then there's that rose right dead center in the middle of the vertical and horizontal axis. You know, that carries a lot of similar symbolism that we're talking about here, essentially. And I feel like it, it's worth bringing up as well. But this idea of the center and, and the cross, you know, and um, the sort of still point in the middle of the wheel relates to our hearts, you know, and that our heart really is the sort of seat of our spiritual impulse, right? It's a center. Uh, arguably, everything has a center. Everything does have a center. Everything has a center point within it. But there's a reason why the heart has kind of been used as uh, the symbolic center of man, 
essentially. And so when I see, or even just in my mind's eye, when I think about the Rosicrucian cross, the rosy cross, that's what I tend to think of as well. And it kind of reminds me too of like Christ having a, um, you know, uh, an illustration of Christ with his heart on fire, something along these lines, you know, there's this idea of a central fire, a lot of older, um, you know, it was an older tradition where people would have a central fire in their home, the hearth of the home, right? This idea of a cosmic sort of fire in the center of everything. This is an old, old, old sort of idea. So these things are definitely coming to mind as well, for sure. And I, I just want to mention real quick, this isn't something that I want to find more information on it. And this is, I think it's more of a recent sort of thing, but there are some Christian sects that don't believe that Christ was crucified, that he wasn't nailed to a cross, but that he was actually um, killed on a post, on just a single vertical post. And so there are paintings and images out there with Christ like that. And I believe there's another storyline before his crucifixion where he may have been tied up to a post as well. And so I think that's kind of a curious sort of thing as it relates to uh, axial symbolism. And I know I've said it here before, but my understanding, according to some books that I have as well, is that what predates the cross is that vertical post, that the standing stone predates the cross. And just that vertical stone existed prior before there being a, um, a horizontal axis or horizontal bar being added to it. So I see, I see polar axial symbolism with the cross too. I love that. Yeah, it's it's there. And there's another version of it that I didn't go into in the slides, but it's worth touching on that the Ankh is a type of cross, as yes. is an anchor. And in a lot of the, especially Orthodox Christianity, they will show Jesus on an anchor, not on a cross. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, exactly. and then anchor has Ankh in it, of course. Now, mm. And then another part uh, part that's fascinating is the staff of Osiris, or like that's a pole as well. The staff that is with a lot of these deities that is some has been called in some ancient texts a Chrysarion, which has the same root as uh, where the word Christ came from, Chrys in Greek. So that's all kind of just side tangents, but <laughs> that's interesting. I mean, relating and then that to the actually that connects to the hands too, like like Cairo, um, you know, the the heart and, and car is the heart. I guess what I wanted to say is there's similarities symbolically between the hand and the heart that they're emblems of this creator, king, sacrificial savior. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, exactly. So in, in even the, what I just brought up with Christ and his flaming heart, you know, um, where his hands generally are, he's like touching his heart, you know, I, I believe with either one or two fingers generally, I could be mistaken on that. But, uh, regarding the anchor too, the pole being the symbolic sort of anchor point or that central axis being a symbolic sort of anchor point reminds me of like a maypole sort of ritual or something along these lines where that's the immutable in, um, immobile axis. It's the stationary axis that everything else revolves around, not unlike the wheel. Right. And so what I kind of, uh, wanted to mention is this idea of uh, the fall of man and some sort of spiritual fall being away from that center point, basically. And so I think that these ancient kings identified with that center point because it's what kept them grounded. It, it literally, it keeps you centered, basically. You know, So in their best light, these kings or lords of old, they brought stability. And I think that they brought a tradition with them. And so this is one of the things that relates to the world axis is this stability on un, not unlike a tree that has roots that go into the ground. It brings just like an anchor table, just like anchor. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Anchor keeps your place in the chaos of the ocean. It's very important. Right, right. Exactly. So you want to be at the middle point within centered, present, grounded, arguably, you know, being that mediator being that axis yourself that that's the other thing too all of this lord king symbolism it relates ex directly to us from where you're at there's four directions from where i'm at there's four directions and it also relates to 
where you live, you know, you, your space, your property, you being sort of the king of your own little kingdom there. And so it's the same sort of idea. It's like the the figure, the head of the house, you know, he's supposed to bring these things to the table, bringing that structure stability, you know, uh, bringing that tradition and uh, having wisdom that kind of spans the ages, ideally, or else he's going to be corrupt. If he's not centered, uh, symbolically, you're moving away from the center of that wheel. And symbolically, this relates to kind of this fall of man, that now you're just on the circumference of the wheel and you're just going around the hamster wheel. Um, but you're not actually embodying um, kind of that still point within, which obviously we all have, and everything is an expression of it anyway, you know, but obviously this can be a concept that that's that gets lost. And arguably, this is the reason why if you think that we live in a dark age, it's because the center has been lost. A, a lot of the symbolism related to the center has basically um, fallen by the wayside. And so what I've heard is that the last great golden age, what it had intact was the concept of the center, that that is the great difference between ages. It's literally how close man is to that center point, that axis point, and how far man is away from it. I really like what you're saying there. I got to respond to Cherie in your chat. She said, chance is a cancer, right? No, I'm an Aries. <laughs> How dare you? Mario's the cancer. Oh, yeah. Just look at me. <laughs> I think I look very cancerian. <laughs> Leo rising, though. Yeah. Catriona knows my signs. Good for you. But what you're talking about being centered is so crucial. And I don't think I've ever pointed this out to you before, but you know, I do biofield tuning. So I work with clients pretty often to, yeah. to figure out where the stock energy is in their aura and what the psychological dilemmas are that keep their energy restrained in some way or keep, or put them in pain or, or what have you. And the first thing that I do in every session is I look for, Eileen McCusick call these, calls these points, the earth star and the sun star. But in terms mm. of a more simple way to comprehend what I'm talking about. It's like the South and North pole of your energy field, the top and the bottom of the sphere. And interestingly enough, the, the points of your energetic center or pole can float out of balance or out of alignment with your physical center based on habitual mm -hmm. ways of thinking or mm -hmm. acting. And it takes a while, but over the course of a life, you know, most people that I tune, I find one or both of those points out of whack, either too close to the body or to the left or to the right or forward or back or some combination mm. of all that. And what I always do is I just tune into those and gently nudge them back into the spot where they're supposed to go. And uh, like whenever I find them out of whack, it tells me something right away about how their life has been. Mm. And a lot of sessions I just go in, try, like I try not to ask a lot of questions and just let what is revealed to me come up to me. And I think that makes it a little more potent when I'm able to describe how they've been feeling so that they can get some trust and belief in the process. But for example, like just off the top of my head, it's always the most recent session that I think of and can remember, but the last person I tuned, the poles of her energy field were, were behind her instead of centered. Whoa. They weren't really left or right, but they were behind her. So she had her energetic <clears throat> pole or center behind her and it gave mm. her this sense of like hesitating or holding herself back from a lot of things that she wanted to do in life and it gave her this feeling of somebody watching and criticizing her from behind that oh wow and even manifested in her life as like kind of undue amounts of criticism from external sources as well so it's like an inner thing and an outer thing so just like <laughs> If all we did in a tuning was get your central pole axis aligned with your physical middle, that has a, t as, and as long as you understand what the, the mental dynamics were that were putting it out of whack, that alone can have a huge effect on someone's day to day. And that's like the very first step one of a tuning. Right. Wow. That is fascinating. I, I love that. It really, it, this symbolism, I can't escape it. It's everywhere. You know, so I'm constantly perpetually thinking about this center point and every single ancient symbol has some sort of correspondence with this, 
fundamental symbols have all uh, a, a different sort of correspondence with this. When you look at any shape, when you look at anything, any star, whatever, I'm now thinking about its relationship to the center. And I feel like I personally am better for it. And, you know, what is said about the center point as well, if all you have to do is just imagine the wheel once again, that the center point is the point of equilibrium and that this is where opposites are unified. And so it's related to unification. It's related to this sort of supreme principle. And the outside of the wheel, just think about the spokes and how the spokes emanate from the center, right? Uh, but they're gonna, they also return to the center as well. That's the thing. Everything emanates from the center, but then also returns to it. So just like toroidal symbolism. Um, but the middle part is unification. The circumference of the wheel would be uh, multiplicity. And so even just looking at the spokes, you have all of these different wedges that are created, you know, on the outside of the wheel. And so going within is the reconciliation of opposites, essentially, you know, it, it's where everything kind of comes together. And so, um, so it seems to me like that is what we have lost as a people, you know, that's why we're so off centered. That's why so many people are completely ungrounded because everything is operating on uh, sort of an external sort of level. Everything is about external validation. Everything is about external uh, solutions to external problems and, and everything else. And so um, it's much easier said than done to kind of em embody this sort of philosophy and idea. But as I've been reading this material lately, I've been thinking about it way, way, way more. And so I feel like it's made me a more holistic person, you know, digging into some of this material. And I know you appreciate this stuff too. And that's really cool to hear uh, the story that you just shared. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Like every tuning has something kind of like that. But to continue with our, our crosses and kings, I, I, we can't talk about the cross without talking about Ixion. There's that IX root. Mm. So uh, back to uh, Greek mythology, the tale of Ixion. He's famously tortured for all eternity due to his transgressions against the gods. I'm not going to go into all the details around that, but he's bound to this fiery wheel. Mm -hmm. And it's basically like the same as the idea of the breaking wheel. It's a form of punishment that's a variation on crucifixion. So here's your cross and your wheel coming together. Like in some of this artwork, he's on the outside of the wheel, but usually he's in the center of the wheel. Like this, these are later depictions that maybe are taking some creative license, I guess. But notice that Ixion is literally in the word crucifixion, crucifixion, I-X-I-O-N. Mm. And knowing the N and R letters sometimes interchange, I wonder if Ixora, that plant, is related to Ixion. Like there could be something there as well. I also like the zodiacal vibe that's on the left hand images wheel. That's some pretty cool artwork. Uh, Virgil says, the author Virgil says, and by the wind of Ixion, the axle of the wheel stopped or moved. Mm. So we have now wind and this figure being correlated and that it's like wind is very associated with the divine or the, the potter, the father, it's the invisible mover, right? But I, I see in Ixion, one of the ways that you could look into, like, look at that word is that the Ixi is kind of like EC, which is savior, Icy, Icy, Iso. There's uh, many words for savior that have that root, like ISI, ISO. And then on could be, is a solar word potentially, and it is a fiery wheel. So that's something. And then the, so <laughs> the thing though about Ixion is that the ancient Greek mythology is so full of, of forgery and I'm, you know, I'm looking into so a new treasure trove of information I found about how much of it was forgery <laughs> that I will <laughs> hopefully be able to share sooner than later. So I, I personally see this Ixion mythology as obscuring the fact that he's actually one of many crucified saviors that came before Jesus. And that's why the, the mythologists, forgers, what have you, made the story so different and they wanted to account for these artifacts of a crucified savior that come from far beyond uh, or far before the era of Jesus. And then back to right. Nimrod, he says that we read in Pindar 
of the venereal bird Yinks or Inks bound to the wheel and of the pretended punishment of Ixion. Now think about with that hard aspirate, like Inks, King, King, right? There's like similar phonetic there as well. The Inks wheel. We're going to talk about that wheel more in a future slide, but Nimrod continues. He says this rotation of Ixion's wheel was really no punishment being as Pindar saith voluntary and prepared by himself and for himself. Or if it was punishment, it was appointed in derision of his false pretensions, whereby he gave himself out as the crucified spirit of the world. Mm. So some of the ancient authors already associate him with the crucified savior, even though the most of the stories of Ixion you get are that he was like a human king and he was just wicked. And so he got this eternal punishment. He tried, basically he tried to, he tried to do it with Hera and that, <laughs> that didn't work so well. <laughs> no, God. Yeah. There's a few things I want to point out in that illustration on the left, which is fantastic. And, um, so the first thing that came to mind that I noticed was that the handle looks to me like it could be uh, a scythe or a sickle actually more of a sickle. So Ooh. to me, very Saturnian. And then the figure that's actually cranking the wheel. To me, I see a lot of crone symbolism as it relates to Saturn. And, and the crone, Saturn, both relate to the scythe and uh, the sickle as well. So I think that that's deliberate, having that sort of subliminal sickle there. And then the other thing I want to point out is the spokes of the wheel, now that we're actually looking at the wheel. So the most basic sort of way you can draw a wheel would be the circle with the cross in the middle. So the quartered circle, right? And so this relates to all the symbolism that we're talking about with kings and crosses and, and whatnot. But yeah, and that bottom right image with just the quartered circle is the oldest of these images. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that one might have, because uh, that's traditional too, having six spokes. I don't know if that one has four or, or six spokes emanating from it. Um, but the spoke itself is not unlike a ray, right? Just like the rays of the sun. And so according to Ganon, he says that the spoke is related to the uh, the ray and the spoke of a wheel is an axial symbol. It's a polar symbol. It's another pole. So even what bridges the gap between the inner and the outer of the circle or the inner and the outer of a wheel literally is just another pole. And that relates to that center point of the wheel itself, which is the axle. Which I think to me, that makes perfect sense. Okay, so I'm going to keep us going here. Sure. I'm trying not to take too long. I have a few more slides. Okay. This is the oldest Ixion that I've been able to find. Mm. And it's a very old Etruscan bronze piece. They date this to 400 to 450 BC, if that's correct. You know how dating goes. But it's about 10 centimeters in diameter. So it's actually very small for the level of detail that it's got, which is a super cool piece. The mainstream academia says that this is the Greek Ixion being rehashed by the Etruscans as they seem to think everything about the Etruscans is, uh, is originally Greek. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't see it, but that's also because I see so much forgery about the ancient Greek authors that it's, uh, the whole thing or the majority of it might very well be a contrivance of the middle ages. Like it's, it's ridiculous, but we'll get to that in a future stream. Uh, I think it's this Greek cover up of an older system that Christianity is based on and it had to be obscured for papal authority and all that. But notice here, the wings on the Ixion figure, this is a huge deal. It's important when we look at the next slides, uh, especially, you know, back to the Etruscans, they are either the same as the Phoenicians or related to them. And although we can't know how much of it is credible. What we are told about the Phoenician mythology by Philo of Byblos in the only known work on it, the Sanchanuathon, he describes basically all of their primal deities as winged like this. So now we have the winged king on the cross or the wheel, the wheel that is a cross. And that's taken us closer to, uh, you know, starting to cross over into female savior or female like queen and cross symbolism and androgen symbolism 
Right, right. And this reminds me of the Wheel of Fortune card. Yeah. Where you have the cherubim, tetramorph angels in the corners, which all have wings. And then you have that central wheel. And um, it reminds me, too, of the fact, I mean, you just have to point out the fact that uh, the penis is right there, right in the middle of the wheel, right? Relating the middle part of the wheel, the axle of the wheel to polar s- symbolism, in my opinion. You know, Good point. This, nice catch. This is why I wanted to show you this stuff. Right, right. Yeah, no, this is absolutely fantastic. So the idea that uh, the heavens are not unlike a wheel, obviously, it's a classic sort of thing here. But yeah, these are fantastic, dude. I, I love what you bring to the table. Sweet. Okay, we'll keep going. So as for the wings question, I want to bring up why are there so many versions of the Christian cross with a dove or a bird above it or on it Mm. you know the one from the left is from milan uh i'm not so sure about the second one but do you have any reflections about like birds and crosses is that something you've come across oh yeah for sure absolutely it's not uncommon for say the ace of cups to have a dove with that wafer that has a cross on it i believe even that's in the um symbol for the uh, oto as well they have a, a dove with a uh with a wafer with that cross on it so the dove and and bird symbolism has related to the cross what comes to my mind at least is kind of what you said earlier about up and down being related to density you know and so you have something that's light and airy the lightest of the elements of the four elements you know at the very top and then i just have to point out with my background with uh how i understand things is that what's being shown here is that there is a middle central pillar here, which relates to uh, a lot of the symbolism that we're talking about. And so you have the pillar on the left, the pillar on the right, arguably Boaz, Joaquin, arguably solar and lunar, which means that the central pillar there is actually polar in nature. And so you're dealing with the same symbolism of the dome that we kind of looked at earlier with the cross on top of the dome or the stupa on top of the dome, right? And so this would be sort of the transcendental uh, axial aspect of the design of what connects the above and the below. So to me, I I see that the the dove definitely makes a lot of sense to kind of put up there. This is more of an esoteric sort of thing, but obviously I know you're here for it too. Uh, I have read that the dove is an old reference to essentially what would be considered a Typhon. You know, Typhon, um, and there's several Typhons out there, but like the Typhonian order or the Typhonian tradition, actually it being a symbol of the Dark Mother is one thing that I've kind of read. Um, I believe that comes from Kenneth Grant. It's Well, linguistically, it's there. Dub, right? Dub means black. Yes, exactly. It's pronounced like B to V swap. It's pronounced like dove as Mm -hmm. well. That's a Gaelic word or Celtic word, dub. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, right. So when I read that, I thought that was very interesting. A a symbol of the Dark Mother. Yeah, and the dove is also a yoni symbol, in my opinion, especially because the Hebrew word yuna or yuni is dove. It's the same Mm. word as yoni. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But we'll get more into that. There you go, that makes sense. Yeah, I I see it, the Dark Mother, Mother of Monsters, type yes, symbolism in exactly the, in there and i actually had more stuff about like hecate as a, a cross goddess and a dark mother but oh, i didn't yeah. you know i didn't actually include that in here just for time's sake but that's mm-hmm. in the mix as well she's got yes. we wheel symbolism for days <laughs> But I wanted to just go ahead quick. I'll say that what I've read before, and it's always just stuck in my mind ever since I read it for that first time, Hecate being the lady of the crossroads and uh, Mercury being the lord of the crossroads as well. And so they kind of play the masculine feminine of, of this cross sort of symbol, which obviously has a lot to do with the crossroads as well. So, but proceed. Yeah, go for it. Oh, yeah. And then the. Uh, the symbolism of Hecate relating to 100 Hecaton is 100 and like c- centurions and Caesar being like the C being a hundred in uh Latin 
Roman numerals, right? And Acer being God. So mm. even this word Kaiser or Caesar is like 100 God is one way that that splits up. Just like Hecate is similar to 100 Hecaton. Mm. Yeah. So that's just that's great, side yeah. tangents. But what I wanted to bring up here that I, I really like this because it's kind of obscure is this idea of yinks or inks or jinx an Arcadian nymph who was the daughter of Pan and Echo. And she was the creator of a magical love charm known by the same name as her name, inks or yinks, jinx. Those are different ways of pronouncing it. And it's a spinning wheel with a Rhineck bird attached to it. The yinx was used by yinx or jinx to make, to uh, make Zeus fall in love with her or in alternative versions to make Zeus fall in love with Io. Now, this is where it starts to get interesting uh, because we're talking about Aries, but if procession is, is real and in a lot of the symbolic archive, it seems like what was what's later Aries symbolism was previously Taurus symbolism, which would make sense if Taurus had the spring equinox in it at a certain point that uh, Io was a cow, right? But she's got the exact same story as Helen of Troy and Believe it or not, Helen of Troy's symbol is the dove, and so is Aphrodite in Greek myth associated with the dove. That's who's in the middle here is Aphrodite, and she's holding a dove. Now, we <laughs> already talked about how the spoked wheel has been shown to be a version of the cross, and it only makes sense as a zodiac or world axis metaphor, too. So later, Christian birds on crosses are the same type as the birds on wheels. And, you know, going back to this, the uh, arch above these two pillars, that's the word arch is the same as the word ras, which is head or wisdom, arche or ruler or king. Kings were called archons in Greek occasionally or, or rulers were. So these jinx wheels, and it's something that causes you to fall in love. You know, Eros is about love as well. That's a Jesus archetype. And the idea of wisdom and the head was associated heavily with the idea of divine love divine love and divine wisdom were kind of symbolically similar concepts that i could i could have gone more into that but that's why the logos or wisdom is shown with the heart all the time according to godfrey higgins the initiates of the cult would actually wear the heart shape symbol as a way to like notice each other out in public which i find pretty awesome and so this jinx thing i want to or this bird on a wheel as like a love charm i want to go deeper into this and crucified goddesses because th there's a, there's more to this to pull on the thread but i want to give you guys a taste of kind of an obscure area of uh mythology so this is a more modern statue i think but it's semiramis <laughs> I guess before I get into it, will you tell me what you see in this Semiramis sculpture? I mean, immediately, I, it reminds me of several other deities. Uh, I see a lot of mercurial symbolism. I do see the solar symbolism with with the crown there. Uh, obviously, you've got that onk, and then it looks like a there is a heart with the uh, rays coming out of it. One thing I picked up from Ganon as well, which I think this makes a lot of sense, when you're looking at ray symbolism and, and you're looking at a sun, straight lines, those rays are more indicative of light, and that when you see the curvy rays, that's more indicative of heat. And so if you see a sun with straight rays and curvy rays, it's both light and heat. And so once I picked that up, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, but, you know, she is the mediator between these two different sort of uh, ideas, you know, reminds me kind of of like a Caduceus. And obviously she's angelic as well. Uh, she's making, you know, kind of uh, this sort of her posture implies you know, almost like a, a cradle or a vessel of some kind, almost like a chalice or something like that. Um, but yeah, those are some of the things I see off the top of my head. Very, very interesting. I've seen it before, but I don't know where it comes from. I don't, I, I couldn't find where it came from in the time I had to look into it today, but there's not a lot that you can find on Semiramis in terms of, of uh, old artifacts. There's 
a one Assyrian image that I I do have in my folder that also people pass around and say it's Ishtar, but that's because all these gods and goddesses are really the same kind of thing. You can see the uh, heart in the middle of her chest there. That's a heart symbol. She's wearing a cross or an ankh. There's six pointed uh, stars. Let's see. I just realized my mouse on my screen is not what you guys are seeing. Okay, so this is the six pointed star. They're on both shoulders. Yeah, and the cross and the heart, and she's got wings and the caduceus ser entwining serpents, and her arms are outstretched like she's crucified. So, yeah, Semiramis, a Syrian goddess. Higgins says that she's the Indian goddess, Sami Rama Isi, possibly. He thinks that she's the dove from Noah's Ark, and he thinks that Semiramis means supreme dove. I find that interesting and plausible. Another link to seeing Helen or Io as the same of, as Semiramis is that Lycophron calls Helen of Troy a pleas, which means dove in Greek. The word dove in Hebrew is yuna, known in modern pronunciation as Jonah, like Jonah in the whale. He's literally, his name literally means dove, and it's the same as the word yoni, the female generative power. Uh, the Greeks are known as Ionians or Hellenes. So there's a, another way that you see that this Yoni or Helen, Dove, same idea. And, of course, the solar connotation of Helios and Helen is, is pretty obvious in my book in terms of the, the root there. Helen is said to have been born out of a waterfowl's egg, which is exactly Helen of Troy. Little known fact, born out of an egg. Same as Semiramis, because uh, Semiramis is also born out of an egg and that demonstrates really that this is the hermaphroditic deity like Phanes or Mithra or, or Brahma. Brahma, another way of considering that name would be Brahm Maya, father, mother. And they're all of these figures born out of the cosmic egg. The dove of Venus, remember Venus Aphrodite, dove symbolism goes with her. Uh, this is okay. I'm going to quote Nimrod. He says, the dove of Venus born on the banks of the Euphrates was a... Maynad or fanatic bird crucified on a wheel with four spokes. The Desmos te tetracnamos or quadratic bond of the wheel is elsewhere described by Pindar as a punishment of the accursed, the eternal crucifixion of Ixion. That's from Nimrod. Now, Semiramis, this is where it gets to me really interesting because now we can see Semiramis, Helena Troy, Io. Got all these overlaps. I actually left stuff out. And she's mythologized as having fought a battle against a king called Starobates on the banks of the Indus River, by whom she was finally defeated and killed by crucifixion. And upon her death, she flies away in the form of a dove. This flying away as a dove is exactly what is said of the Roman emperors who are deified on their deaths. And we got to have to point out Starobates, this king, is a fascinating name because the Greek word for a cross, as in one you'd crucify a person on, is staros. And bates is the same word, remember the BV swap, as vates, which is what the, the Latins called the Druids. And so that's a word that refers to Druids or priests or fortune tellers. Vates, bates, fates, fates. It's all philologically there similar, similarly. So this King Starobates is like, that name is basically saying he's the King Priest of the Cross. <laughs> I could go on and on about that, but you know, for time's sake, I'll just add that the dove flying away is akin to the Phoenix. And there you have the IX coming up again in another word. And back to the bull of it all, we know that this Venus figure is super associated with Taurus, right? And in ancient Greek writing, or how they spelled things, there was a, a letter called Sigma Tau. And because of this letter, it was often confused or interchanged that T, S, and ST interchanged all the time. So now think about the word staros, that means cross. Just drop that S, as happened all the time. You've Taurus, Taros. Taurus is the sign of Venus. <laughs> so maybe this was all in the age of Taurus when... The, that sign was the spring equinox when this symbolism began. But there's the crucified goddess.
Excellent. I love it, man. So much good stuff to riff off of from here, honestly. Uh, just because you brought it up right now, but Tau as well relates to the circle. And there's people who say that we should be using Tau, not Pi, to do our math. If Isn't I'm Tau not, like two Pi? Yes, exactly. And I've heard that it's actually simpler to use. And so years ago, I came across a website and they gave all the reasons why we should be using Tau and not Pi. So Tau relates to the circle as well. Uh, and of course, Tau, Tav, all these T letters are crosses. That's right. Yep. The Tau cross, exactly. Uh, Tau corresponds with the last card of the Major Arcana, which is the world card, where you're going to have um, also the cherubim angels, you know, in the corners, and you're going to have a woman central, you know, to the card. In a wheel. In a wheel. Exactly right. This also reminds me of the Wheel of Fortune. Uh, I believe it used to be called, and or it, at at one point it was referred to as the wheel of fates as well and you brought up fate right now so wheel of fortune wheel of fates to me that makes a lot of sense also that card the wheel of fortune is the 10th card of the major arcana so we're dealing with roman numeral x and so there's cross symbolism baked into that card as well and it's also ruled by jupiter which the glyph for Jupiter looks like the number four, the king of planets. Its glyph looks like the number four related to Zeus, right? The king of the gods and all these other things. So definitely, you know, there's a lot of overlap with that. And then I just wanted to point out two more things about this image and, and about what you just said, but she has seven spokes or seven rays. So that central ray to me kind of reminds me of this cosmic sort of ray, the seventh ray. And also... The whole idea with the egg um, giving birth or, or being um, where these androgynous figures come from, this also relates to Gemini symbolism. So Castor and Pollux being born from an egg. Uh, I've heard that Hermes has his little hat, his little helmet with uh, wings on it, right? And that this is a reference to the cosmic egg. My understanding is the reason why this is a thing with uh, androgyny is because our auras, our light body, our energetic bodies are very egg-like. And so if you imagine us within the egg, our, our light body, we operate as a pole in the middle of the egg. And according to some authors, the first era or the first sort of, um, yeah, uh, epoch, epoch, how do you usually say it? E-P-O-C-H. How do you say it, Chance? Epoch, epoch. I'm good with either. <laughs> either way. <laughs> but the first age of man has been described as the Polarian Epoch, the Polarian Age, right? And so because we have yet to have our physical body, and so we operate it as something of a pole within our energetic body. And so with a pole, you have positive and negative, light and dark, whatever you want to say, you know, just like magnetism or whatever. So the egg in and of itself, within it, you can almost imagine those two points, those two extremes. Uh, just like a magnet, positive and negative within that egg and within, uh, you know, our light body here. So just wanted to throw out those things. Um, if we have time, man, do you mind if I share a couple of quick images? And I know we want to kind of uh, get out of here, you know, in, in a reasonable time. You got you got stuff going on, as do I. You know? Is it is it pertinent to what I just was on or do, is it cool if I knock out the last couple of slides that, go that for sort it. of pertain to this? No, no, go for it. It could relate, but you, you should definitely just, uh, you know, wrap it up here with your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I just got a little bit more to say. So remember that inks or yinks jinx, that's the symbol for the freaking hunger games, which is about sacrifice. Oh. Yeah. 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 Somebody knew, do you see uh -huh. this? Like it's a bird on the wheel. <laughs> right. It's crazy. And she's even got wings like, come on. And she's got the arrows symbolism. The bird in the Hunger Games they call, I think, is a mockingjay. So that's a repeating what others say, right? It echoes. And Jinx mm. or Yinx was the daughter of Pan and Echo. <laughs> so like, mm. who, th this was not just thoughtless pop culture. I, I, you know, there's some weird hidden hand behind this stuff, or it's just synchromistic, and it's embedded in the framework of people's creative consciousness. I don't know, but. The funny thing about this Mockingjay or Daughter of Echo with Jinx is that <laughs> what what did most people growing up say Jinx for? 
I'm, I'm sorry, come again? Why? What is the thing that kids say jinx for? Like, why would a kid say oh, jinx? Oh, when you say the same thing at the same time. Echo. Yeah. Oh, right. It's like still in our, in our, who knows how long that's been in the psyche of human children just repeating and passing forward, right? Oh, right. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, right. And then uh, the phoenix is a bird of paradise. Parrots, birds of paradise, they parrot your your words. There's an echo thing going on. There's something, yeah, there's some weird thing going on with all this. <laughs> uh, and I, I just had to bring that up. Like, come on, come on, Hollywood. It's right there. Right, now, right. the re repetition of this mythos happens a lot, you know, with saints being just a, a rehashing of the stories of gods and goddesses in the Middle Ages. This is the crucifix crucifixion of Saint Eulalia said to have been martyred in 303 AD in one story, but there's actually more than one version of this. Sometimes Eulalia is called Julia instead, which is basically Julius, which is Yule or Hule or Hulios, Helios, solar title. Mm -hmm. But the story of Eulalia is that at the age of 13, she's the daughter of a noble family that lived near the city of Barcelona and was being, her family was persecuted by Diocletian and the governor arrived in the city intent on enforcing all the decrees against the Christians, yada, yada. She leaves her home, enters the city, confronts the governor for his persecution of Christians. And then she, uh, by the governor, she's stripped and flagellated and then put on the uh, St. Andrew's cross. Mm. <laughs> and when she dies, a dove is supposed to have flown forth from her mouth following her death. And then a sudden snowstorm covered her naked body like a garment. So, you know, they're oh, just repeating the same thing over and over again. There's like right, three different right. versions of this in the stories of of martyred saints. Exactly. Exactly. I there's a movie, I can't even remember what it's called, uh, but they have a bird flying out of a guy's mouth who has just died. <laughs> and so it kind of reminds really? me of that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. That's fascinating though. What a brutal way to go. <laughs> Luckily, this Obviously. is fictional, you know, in my opinion. Well, I mean, um, people, you don't think people were crucified like that? Oh, well, yeah, maybe so. Uh, there, There is a lot of reason to dispute the alleged, like, persecution of Christians mm. being uh, a lot of that is, is likely forged. Like, for example, there's there's nothing in the the known records of Roman civil law that's a, that's against Christians in any way. You know, I, I think, see. have you, you see this as a pattern, right? The, <laughs> the certain type of uh, individuals that want to control everything that make, make it out that they're the ultimate victims. Yes. <laughs> I've, I've noticed that before. <laughs> indeed. Six million. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. right. It goes, yeah. It's, it's an old trick. It's a super old trick. And so anyway, the persecution of Christians is, is likely one of those tricks, but yeah, possibly people were crucified and that would suck. That would definitely suck. <laughs> right, right. But the the last little part I wanted to put in here is, uh, yeah. you know, this is a, a great quote from Godfrey Higgins where he says, the wheel denotes the world of which she is the spirit and the cross, the sacrifice made for that world. Mm -hmm. Inx is used for love, desire, appetition, and thence the, lat the Latin word, youngo, I unite. And our name for the age of sensual love is young. So this idea, like the Pleiades, for example, that's the image in the top left, the sisters mm -hmm. of the Pleiades, that, that word represents the idea of being united. And it might be also related to the word for dove, which is in the Pleiades were seen as doves in the, in the sky as well. The ancient Greek word for dove being peristera. Uh, so Pleiades is the constellation of the doves. And right. <laughs> I, you know, this uh, whole uniting of our inner and outer worlds in this Latin word, Jungo, just had couldn't help but think of uh, the great Carl Jung, it, like a strange synchromysticism that his name pertains to this idea of of union of our our masculine and feminine energies or our yin and our yang, our inner and outer. Yeah. Got it. Right. Well, one thing I'll, I'll just add to this um, is that at this point, I've read this from three or four authors, which doesn't make it true, but I think it's fascinating. 
And the idea that a lot of symbolism related to the Pleiades came from Ursa Major and that Ursa Major and its seven stars were once the sort of primordial axis, the earlier axis uh, up to the pole star. And then during the solar age, during this transition, that the symbolism with Ursa Major got shifted over to the Pleiades. And now the Pleiades and arguably too, the sort of axis that exists from Taurus to Scorpio for a lot of people is now sort of the uh, the transcendental kind of stairway to heaven, but that perhaps there was an original location with that. And the reason why I bring this up too is because the star card, which I identify with being the pole star, you always see it's a tradition to have a bird on top of a tree in the background of the star card. Right. And so and there's a lot of feminine symbolism associated with the northern sky and the circumpolar constellations and things like that. Um, so just kind of bringing it back to some of this bird symbolism, which is what actually, if it's not too much trouble, I just sent you a link in our private chat. But so much of what you brought up is resonating with uh, the Rosicrucians and, and some of their symbolism, which I hadn't even really been thinking about. But as you bring the dove to the table and uh, things of that sort and some of the um, botany, you know, photographs and everything. I'm reminded of this illustration. You'll find this in The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall. And there's a whole huge correspondence here with so many of the things we just mentioned, right? But this is a pelican and there's a lot of symbolism about the pelican um, bleeding for her children and that the, the children are going to uh, feed literally off of her blood. There's like, I've read several variations on what this is actually referencing, but it reminds me a lot of Christ symbolism. And obviously you have that cross right there. And then right in the middle of that cross, you have that rose. And then this is all within the frame of a compass, which I think is very interesting. The compass more so relating to the circle um, which is more indicative of the heavens. And I kind of see, personally, I see that point of pivot with the compass kind of operating as that uh, axial bridge. I almost see that as probably the pole star, or I see that as um, being at the center of a wheel, basically that spins. And then of course you got that crown up top as well. So different ways of looking at right, it. Right, you but see a compass, you gotta think of a circle. That's it, that's it, yep, exactly right. So you have literally the cross within a circular symbol. And this is traditional, right? Freemasonry, the cross or the, uh, excuse me, the square being related to earth and then the compass being related to the heavens, you know, with that G right there in the middle, right? The seventh letter also relating to gamma, also relating to the number three, if I'm not mistaken. So just within the Freemasonic symbol of the compass in the square, you kind of have this um, three world concept that, we kind of started the show off with right heaven man and earth in in my opinion and and man being the uh, the axial bridge between the two and then just briefly as well i probably should have sent you this beforehand but this is just the full card this is the standard rider weight full card but when i look at that sun now and i take into account symbolism as it relates to the sun uh the sun being something of an axial symbol, right? Being at the center for a lot of people relating to polar symbolism. And so I think it's fascinating that you have the pole uh, shooting up to the sun right there. And if you count the rays, now I'll admit this might be a stretch on my behalf, okay? Hmm. But when you count the rays from uh, the top portion of the card and work your way down, or you count the rays from the side and work your way inward, there are 14 rays, okay? So if you count from the top going down, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that seventh ray almost touches that pole. And then it does the exact same thing when you work your way out and, and work your way in. So the two rays that are considered to be the seventh ray, if you will, the two central rays are kind of cradling that pole, which reminds me of some of the seventh ray symbolism that I've looked mm -hmm. into being that transcendental ray, right? Now, this card also relates to polar symbolism, in my opinion, because what I'm starting to see with the full coming down the mountain 
is that he's actually descending the polar mountain. He's actually descending the central mountain that the emperor is associated with. This is to say that he is leaving the center of the wheel, going towards the circumference of the wheel to go through another cycle. And then he'll be back again. So that's kind of how I see it. And to me, when I think now about, I don't know, cosmic cycles or perhaps uh, karmic cycles and, and things like that, when people talk about breaking cycles, it's by going to the center. But when you leave that center and you choose to go to the circumference of the wheel, you're choosing to go through another sort of uh, passing of, of the wheel. And so I think that's what you're seeing because the fool relates to liminal spaces he relates to the space in between other spaces. He's the number zero, uh, which arguably has a lot to do with unity. So I, I see it that he's leaving the unity of that central immutable point within the wheel, uh, the central mountain, the polar mountain, and he's going to the edge of the wheel and he's gonna go through a whole cycle, which essentially is the major arcana. And then he's gonna come back again. I can't believe I never thought of this dude, but you know, what sounds the letter P can make alternatively to just the sound P is uh, also F sound F. Like the letter P in Hebrew is like F or P. So think about fool with a P instead. I mean, all you got to do is just slightly close the glyph for the <laughs> yeah, English F say. and it's a P. Right. Is the fool the pole? Exactly. And that is one of the classic symbols that he's associated with i don't have unless it's a newer card all of the traditional cards he has a pole sometimes he actually has two because the pole is such a primordial symbol because it relates to that center for sure that's a good one man this whole thing has been a good one dude <laughs> awesome, a couple man. honorable mentions that i didn't put into slides the the word in hebrew for cross is Sle uh, selev or to sell of it's basically it's Sadi Lamed uh, Sadi Lamed none maybe I'm spelling that wrong anyway <laughs> basically that word means X like the sign X and a mark and mm -hmm. why why that matters is I, I just think it's interesting how it starts with the Sadi which is the letter that's on the Emperor card Kings were marksmen before they would be, were able to write their name. They would just sign with the X. That was a really common thing. Ooh, right. The uh, and then the emperor card, aside from pertaining to the letter Saudi, it correlates to Chesed or Chesed in the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. That's the Sephirot, and that word Chesed is seventy two, where the word King, which is Melech, is ninety. Both of those reduced to a nine. The letter Sadi is 90 in the powers of notation. Mm -hmm. And now remember all the words that we covered with this IX, which is the Roman numeral nine. Is that part of where that uh, those words came from? I don't know. It's synchromistic. But the last <laughs> the last fun uh, gematria weave is that that Latin and ancient Greek word basilius that means king in Latin gematria is 417. 417 that's today's date mm, oh nice there you go <laughs> right on man that's a good one for sure uh, related to 90 real quick 90 degree angles right for a square four. or a cross or a cube which the emperor traditionally too in a lot of decks he's sitting on a cubic stone he's related to the cubic stone and so i just made a post about this about him uh, sitting on a cube and being being related to the cube and how this kind of interfaces with being a central stone a la, you know, uh, the Kaaba cube, you know, being the central totem in Mecca that people circumambulate and everything else. But this was awesome, dude. You're, you're a great weaver. That's for sure. <laughs> Our powers combined is pretty formidable, man. This was <laughs> an excellent show. Uh, we got to keep doing these whenever the inspiration strikes, you know, on the uh, 417 tip too. That's one of my favorite self geo numbers. If anybody out there is interested in biofield tuning, uh, I've got Awesome results. I just got a text from somebody that I tuned about two and a half, three weeks ago. And he said, I was waiting until I was sure and that it wasn't just a fluke. But after our session, the lower back pain that he'd had for, he says, 12 years. And he was a fairly younger dude. 
that was gone and had stayed gone. So that's the kind of thing we could work on together. Pain, dysfunction in the body, really all of the things going on with the body start with the mind and the emotions and especially the belief systems. If you're curious about what I'm talking about, biofield tuning, you can go to my website, innerversepodcast.com slash sound dash healing. The wait list for getting a session typically runs about four, five weeks out, sometimes six weeks. So if it's something you want to do, look into it sooner than later. That way you're not stuck waiting too long. And we just have a great time. I'm always, <laughs> I'm always just glowing after sessions about how fun it is because it's a lot like what we do here. I'm getting into somebody's belief system and events from their life and applying the same type of pattern recognition. And it's like, it can be like an accelerated form of therapy because rather than needing to go through every single thing that someone's experienced or all the traumas, we can just get to the root, figure out the patterns, help them break those patterns. And it's super efficient. So wanted to plug that while we had the audience here and there's lots of Lots of other ways you can support the channel linked in the show notes. I also would recommend Tipica new herbs use the interverse coupon code, get some excellent herbal medicine and Mario, you got any plugs you want to lay on the folks before we uh, wrap it up? Yeah. I'll just let people know that they can find me at symbolic studies.com. They can find all of my links there. If you haven't followed me on social media or YouTube, definitely give that a go. I'm posting all the time and I follow each sign during the sign itself. So I'm always, presenting content related to the signs. I'm gearing up to do a major arcana series, a deep dive into the major arcana. And so that'll be an exclusive for people on Patreon and on my site and things like that. So um, if you follow me, you can keep tabs on when that launches. It should be this month sometime, but uh, that's pretty much it, man. Thanks for having me. This was a great time as usual. I uh, I have a bunch of notes, uh, you know, as per usual as well to follow up with. So. Good stuff, dude. Really good stuff. And I also forgot to thank uh, Polymathing for the super chat. Thanks, brother. $10 Canadian. Very appreciated. And they're talking about in the chat. You said I was a, a weaver. And I do have this spider tattoo right here on my, my forearm. And now this doesn't get noticed because Jenny doesn't come on to live streams. But my wife has and she had this before we met and i had my t t tattoo before we met and on the exact same arm in the exact same place she has this circular geometric design of a triangle uh pattern that is exactly like a, a geometric web you know more mm. more perfect than an actual spider web but i have the spider she has the web on the same arm in the same spot it's like kind of far out <laughs> <laughs> we were nice. we were meant to go together. So I just had to mention that because of the spider the symbolism has it. been coming up so strongly for me, dude, over, over the last like eight months or so. There's so much to talk about with that. Um, so that that's really cool. That's a that's a heavy sink. If you get into if you want to do spider talk on the show, I'm I'm always game for that. Excellent. excellent one right of my on. spirit animals. <laughs> Nice. Okay, everyone, symbolicstudies.com. Make sure that you're following this guy on TikTok or Instagram as well and the YouTube. He's just always putting out great work and look forward to the next time we get to collaborate, brother. It's been a real pleasure. It's an honor that we're we are able to do it. Yeah, dude. Much love, much respect. Looking forward to the next one for sure. Good night, everybody. See you guys.